In reflecting upon her battle against an aggressive kidney cancer, Tammy Peterson said, quote, I know now from praying, because I've been doing a lot of praying, that it's the practice that is the most important part. And although everybody wants it to be the show that's the important part, it is the practice. It is the daily practice. Tammy Peterson on Illness and Grace, the Crucifix and the Rosary, now. My name is Todd Warner, and this is the Evangelization and Culture Podcast from Word on Fire. Tammy Peterson is a wife and mother, a licensed massage therapist, and a host of the Tammy Peterson Podcast. After graduating from high school in 1979, she moved to Central Canada, where she worked and studied and was married in 1989. Tammy raised two children with her husband, Jordan, and has three grandchildren whom she adores. Tammy attended university and studied kinesiology and visual art. She owned and operated a massage therapist business for 30 years. Most recently, Tammy also spent three years working as a logistics consultant for her husband, Jordan, organizing his daily itinerary on his sold out worldwide book tour. They traveled the world giving talks in 140 cities. In 2019, she suffered and recovered from a near fatal illness which changed and deepened her understanding of how life ought to be lived. Over the last 18 months, Tammy toured in the United States, Australia, and Europe to over 250 cities with her husband. During this tour, she opened most shows with her personal reflections on the chapters of the book, Beyond Order. Tammy Peterson, welcome. Hey, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Segment one, meet Tammy Peterson. Interviewed about his wife, Tammy, Jordan Peterson recalled, quote, in our small Canadian town of Fairview, Tammy lived across the street from me, and I think I fell in love with her the moment that I saw her. I don't think the feeling was necessarily mutual. I was seven, end quote. And in describing his marriage to Tammy, he went on, quote, you want a little bit of trouble in the relationship, a little bit of mystery, a little bit of combativeness, and the ability to exchange opinions forthrightly. I trust her which is a huge element, end quote. So Tammy, what was it that made your husband fall in love with you and what has made you so trustworthy? Well, I had really long hair. <laughs> hair right down to it. And I think that was part of it. That's a start. Right, I had hair. And maybe, and I liked having all that long hair. I could swish it around. Um, I came, my dad was a really extroverted guy. He was the most well-known guy in the district because he just had a, he was a big personality. Yeah. And um, I think that he taught me to be confident. He taught me that uh, independence was very important mm -hmm. and that um, he, he always said what he thought, so I said what I thought. Yeah. So I think a lot of it came from my father. That's fantastic. We'll talk more about some of the stories that Jordan and you have shared about your uh, kind of kind of upbringing together. I know you grew up in, in Fairview, a small town in Alberta, Canada. To what degree did growing up in a small town make you into the person that you are today? Mm. Well, I got to be in uh, the, a school with only 30 kids in the class. I think 45 of us graduated in grade 12. So I knew everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone knew me too. So we all knew each other. So that's a community. Yeah. Right? That's a community. For that's sure. a that's a reasonable sized community for a child. And so I think some of these huge schools that they have now uh are you can be anonymous in them. Yeah. And that's that's tricky for a kid because we really need each other, just like a husband needs a wife, so you can bounce off each other. You need that when you're a child to bounce off each other. And so I think that and, and also, also when I was seventeen, I decided I was I was elected to become the supervisor for the local outdoor swimming pool. Sure, as my sisters had done and my brother had done, so I was just following suit, really. Uh, but on the first day that the schools came to the pool, the little six-year-olds jumped in, and the pool's too deep. So I had it sectioned off in three sections. So there were three classes. 10 in each, oh no, it was one class, 10 kids in each section to kind of keep some organization. And I found myself saying uh, to my other lifeguards, there's one underwater, there's one underwater. And so at the end of that, I said, look, teachers, this pool's too deep yeah. for these little kids. And we don't have one of those pools where the bottom lifts up right. or something. It was just a 1967 
expo, you know. Square, <laughs> a rectangle, what have you, yeah. Right. And so I said, next time you come out, I'd like a parent in the water for each 10 kids. Three parents. Three teachers. I don't care. Yeah. Three people in the water with these kids because they need to be monitored very closely. And the next time they showed up, they hadn't done anything. So I wouldn't let them in the pool. And I knew the mayor because he was, he was one of my dad's friends. And uh, that's the thing. Small town, right? He, he was one of my dad's friends. Right. Of course he was because they were both businessmen. He was a plumber. He's a plumber. He became uh, mayor eventually. And so he, know, he knew me. And I knew everybody on the school board. I knew everybody on town council mm. as well. And when I said that I would run it their way, they just had to write down what they wanted. I wanted in writing yeah. what they wanted me to do. And one of these little old farmers that I knew very well, I, I used to go and uh, head chickens at his farm and, you know, get fresh farm eggs and things from his farm. Uh, he said uh, something like, if we write down what we want you to do, you'll let a kid drown. And I was 17. And I thought that was a shocking thing for him to say. Right. And so I was confused by that. And uh, I wrote a letter to the newspaper. Mm -hmm. But the newspaper gave the letter to the mayor before it was published. Oh, no. So he could, re he could just put whatever he wanted right beside it. And uh, I got frustrated and I quit my job. I quit my job and then the local vocational college hired me. Yeah. They just came and said, do you want a job? And I went to pick weeds, which was way <laughs> easier and way more. I, I like to pick. I like when I'm stressed, I get down in the dirt. Something therapeutic about the right? repeated, yeah. And so that was a good thing to do for the rest of the summer. But that was a, a, a small town. So I became jaded for politics sure. at that moment. I said, you know, this mayor and the way this is, this could easily be federal government. Yeah. This could be provincial government. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any difference between this bureaucracy and any other bureaucracy that's around here. And I don't trust it. And so I spent quite a, And then Jordan, of course, I married him. Yeah. And he was into politics because he was, well, thinking and figuring out what was important in life. And he knew that at least the electorate, you need to attend to that. So he was trying when he was 14, 15, 16, 17, decided he wasn't a socialist anymore because he'd tried that. Um, but I didn't. And I didn't even want to vote. Like, yeah. it really, it really jaded me. Later, I realized, you know, uh, it wasn't up to me to quit. How it was long, up to them to fire me. How, how long was, out of curiosity on that, I have two questions, Th that sense of being jaded and somewhat... Oh, it lasted for years. That's what I was going to say. Was Decades. it something that was into, you were 30 before you were voting again or something yeah. like that? Okay, okay. The other thing I was going to say is, my wife was raised in a small town. There is that, that, that the good part is there's a sense of accountability. Everybody knows everybody. The bad part is that Everybody knows everybody, <laughs> yeah, right? right. And, and and so to right. some extent, you know, you see the sausage being made. I mean, you've got access to the, the the city council or to the mayor, or you know, your dad's larger than life and knows everybody, and and so on and so forth. But like you said, there's there's also the notion that um, you also see a lot of warts, and you see a lot of aspects of it that are. And of that, course, though, but at that time of my life, I didn't I didn't see that darkness. Right. I didn't know. That I, I, I thought if I was telling the truth and saying what was necessary, I would be understood. Yeah. But that's not the case. And, you know, even though it's a small town and everybody knows everybody, you don't know anybody. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Right? Because when I got married to Jordan, he lived up the street. He lived across. And then when they moved, they moved up the street. So we just lived right beside each other. And uh, I didn't know anything about his family. Mm -hmm. I, I knew his sister. Yeah. His dad taught me. But I didn't know anything about his family, right, right. and he didn't know anything about my family, even though we were small town, close proximity. Yeah, but you're not in the house. Yeah, you're not in the house with the family. Right. Then you know the family. Right. That's why family knows family. Yeah, yeah. Chesterton says the self. I think he says something along the lines of the self is as distant as the farthest star. Something right. along those lines. <laughs> that, that. That, that the notion of uh, how much do we even know ourselves? We spend all our time with ourselves, much less our family, much less the people. So so to, to some extent, you're absolutely right. There is that proximity. There is that familiarity. And yet, because of the human condition and, and the fact that families have their own 
you know, dramas within yeah. their homes, how much do we really truly know people? So that's that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. We sometimes make, and I can be the, guilty of this too, we make certain assumptions that this is the way in the small town and here it is right, in the big right. anonymous city. And it's sort of like, well, there's human nature is everywhere. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, you know, as, as was mentioned in the segment's opening, it, it was in Fairview that you first met a thin, bashful, but intriguing boy who made a big impact on your life. So tell me a little bit about meeting and falling in love with, with Jordan. From the beginning? Do you take it how you want to take it? Okay. Maybe so when, I mean, the first meeting would be kind of curious. Was it, do you recall? <laughs> um, well, he recalls. I don't really, I don't really recall. There, there was a few moments that Jordan recalled that I had to remember. Yeah. One of them was that he came over in grade five. So he'd been there two years. He came over in grade five to show me his new glasses and I laughed at him. Because I wanted glasses. I remember hearing so, <laughs> so, so I wasn't going to like How his long class. was it before Jordan realized why you, because you made a comment to him and he kind of was like this. I think he, you let him know later, I think, that there was a, a little envy oh, sure. in the glasses. Oh, yeah. sure. You know. And we, we, had, we had really good friendship in grade 12. We decided we were all on student council and we had a, a little room for all the students to go in and just talk and so we and we said you know grade 12 we're not going to see each other again most of us let's just get along let's just dissolve all the cliques let's just be a class which happens I think a lot in grade 12 everybody kind of realizes that it's over and so they become almost sentimental right for this last year and we had a lovely year that year and Mm. we had grown apart Probably grade seven and eight. Jordan was still very short because he was a year younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uh, an outspoken person. Mm. And so the bullies in uh, the grade seven and eight didn't like him. Or maybe they liked him too. Like, you know, I don't know what they're called. I don't know what a men's uh, association is like, but they used to hang him upside down by his feet over the second floor uh, walkway. In the mornings, oh. hang them in the locker. There were a number of boys that were hung in their lockers and stuff by other kids. This is middle school or elementary. This is middle yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tough years. Brutal, Yeah, eh? yeah. Brutal. And high school, <laughs> junior high dances where nobody dances. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so we did that quite a bit. And I wasn't hanging around with him because he was still pretty young. So I started hanging around with kids who were in grade 9 or sure. in grade 10, you know. So I found some friends that were of that age and that's who I hung up out with and my girlfriends of my age, but boys a little older, which George said is really common yeah. for girls is they, they gravitate to older boys because their maturity is more matched sure. for that. So really it was when we were 26 mm. because I was at university in Ottawa. Um, he had uh, two years before that, he'd said he was going to move to Ottawa. He had a, research position and I was ready for him to come yeah. to and then he didn't come okay he didn't come he didn't get it and I started going out with somebody else were you dating from afar were you exchanging letters well, from afar see each other, yeah we see yeah. each other once a year okay once a year at Christmas so you're in Ottawa he's not you're dating somebody else yeah. how does and then, and then he phones me uh-huh. one night in uh, October yeah and he said hi Tam I I live in Montreal which is a two-hour drive away, okay. right? And I thought, oh, that's good. Yeah. And so he said, do you want to come for Thanksgiving dinner? And so I did. I left and I went there, and it was a different meeting. Mm. I mean, when, it, when, he was, when I had left high school, I came home the next year, and he'd grown a foot, right? Because wow. he'd gone wow. from yeah. four foot 11 <laughs> to like six foot one. Yeah. All of a sudden, <laughs> it's different. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay, you grew up. You finally grew up. So when I went to see him in Montreal, it was like, you've matured. You're writing a book. You're mm-hmm. getting your PhD. You have a big group of friends. Your house is clean. Yeah. Um, probably marryable. So this so so this is where he kind of crosses the threshold for eligible for you. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. And he had, and girls had started getting interested in him. I thought, yeah, this is exactly the right moment. I'm gonna marry him. So so what so and how did it when did you guys court for a while and then Yeah, we did. Yeah. We did. I lived next I lived with one of the other graduate schools in a in an apartment. She didn't have any room for me. So I in Montreal they have these uh like ante rooms on the backs of all these three story walk ups yeah. that are mostly just made of wood. Okay. I built a room back there. Mm. I built a room back there and I that's where I lived 
for a while. This is my after I'd left university and my parents dropped me off in Montreal to Jordan's house. And uh, we weren't only, we were only a few blocks apart. And so probably we'd see each other like every three days sure. or so. And he introduced me to all his friends at university and which was very kind. Yeah. And um, it was, so that was, that was probably August when I moved there. And then in March, um, I was getting ready to get married. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really saying anything. And on, I didn't know this, but March 29th, when it comes around, yeah. is uh, Sadie Hawkins Day. Okay. That's the day that a woman can ask a man to marry. So I did. I asked him. Oh, He'd wow. already asked me three times. But he asked me, like, in a letter, <laughs> kind of written on the envelope, will you marry me? And I thought, really? <laughs> you know, so I didn't really take that very seriously. And he asked me one other time, and I said, not yet. Yeah. I had never said no to him. Right, right. But I was ready, so I asked him if he'd marry me, and uh, he said yes. And then the you guys ultimately married in 1989, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it took a couple of years yeah. to get married. Good for you, though. I, I, the other thing you said is Sadie Hawkins Day. We're used to, you know, in America, the Sadie Hawkins dance was, you know, ah. the girl asked the guy. Oh, okay. I didn't know there. I, I didn't. I didn't, know that. I didn't know that there was a Sadie Hawkins Day. That was. Is that a Canadian kind of a Canadian tradition? I don't know. Or? Maybe I made it up. It worked. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Forevermore, Sadie Hawkins Day. All the listeners out there, this is the day for women to ask their yeah. their prospective husbands to marry them. That's, that's right. That's wonderful. You know, so so I. The, I presume there's many people that that have asked you, what's, what's it like being married to Jordan Peterson? I want to turn the question around and ask, what's it like for Jordan Peterson to be married to you? Mm, yeah, well, that hmm. it's changed over the years. Uh, I was always, well, he told me I had to tell the truth. And so I did. Yeah. And so he was um, surprised at that, that I was uh, dedicated to this one axiom that he had put down as necessary. But we'd been friends for a long time, and I did trust him. Yeah. I, I trusted him. He always, I'd come home at Christmas, and I'd look at my watch, and within 15 minutes, he'd knock on my door. Mm. So he knew when I arrived. Mm. That's great. So so he was someone I trusted. Yeah. I trusted his family. I trusted his father. He was a great teacher. So when it came to marriage and listening to him, I listened to him. Mm. And we listened to each other, yeah. I think. Yeah, we, we listened to each other. And when we had a disagreement, uh, we would try to talk it out, and if we couldn't talk it out, we'd go in separate rooms and think about what we'd brought to the table. If anything we'd done in our life that may have brought us to that argument, mm -hmm. then we would go back and we would talk about that, and that would usually open it up again, and yeah. then you'd have resolution and maybe some understanding. So you, so you went to into your separate rooms to yeah. pray for something better, really, yeah, yeah. right? Just like a timeout for children. Yeah. That's what it is. It's a prayer. Yeah, You say... Uh, this kid and, and you are in an altercation uh, or or the kid is doing something, screaming at you and and you're not understanding and you put the kid in the bedroom until they're quiet mm -hmm. and separate from each other. What you're doing is you're saying, I don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. We need some counseling here. We need a moment. Yeah. We, we, we need a moment. That's a time out to say, Okay, God, is there a uh, is there something that I don't understand? Is there a way I can move forward? Yeah. And when the child stops crying and you take them out, there's usually a new reconciliation, and off you go again. So prayers. So I think George. I mean, I just came to that realization about children and parents and timeouts when I was with my granddaughter, and she was screaming in an angry way. She's 14 months old about what she wanted from her mother. Yeah. And so we taught that weekend to just give her time out. She screamed in her crib for an hour and a half the first time. Wow. Because she thought that would yeah, work. Because yeah, it had worked. Yeah. So she was holding on to that. And the parents She's are all, She's a disagreeable is, yeah, little yeah. girl. Like she was going to, and ex extroverted too. So she wants to, she wants things and she wants them now. Yeah. And that's kind of a sign of our society right now. Yeah. I want things and I want them now. Yeah. And so they never had, those kids never had enough timeouts. Yeah. And neither did their parents. Because you have to take that child out of that situation, put them there until they stop, then take them out and they realize that it's the calmness. Mm -hmm. So they're learning to reorganize their brain in a more sophisticated way. And then they are 
learning how to be calm because they haven't learned anything about how to be calm. Right. They've just been railing away and getting what they want. So there's no learning there. Right. Right. There's no learning there. And so over just a day, she began to have joyous moments, just like just like a little 14-month mm-hmm. ought to. And when they went home the next day, they had a quiet drive home, no complaints. But when they got there to the home, we had the same, they had the same, uh, you know, explosions of, of emotions whenever her mom wasn't around. Mm-hmm. And she'd have nothing to do with her dad when her mom was around either. Mm. And so this was getting to start to uh, complicate their lives. And their older son was probably not getting as much attention because this girl was getting all the attention. Right, right. So when she did that again, they did the same timeouts. She regained her composure and started to want her dad, mm. really, mm. started to want to be with him, even when her mom was there. And their son started to have a better time doing the play activities that he was sent out of the home to do because right. he was getting more attention, I imagine. Right. And all they want is attention, those yep. kids. But they need to have that. They need to have good communication, not bad. You don't want to keep reinforcing this bad communication. And this time out is a prayer to say, okay, God, we we don't know what to do. And then you bring us back together again. And it's a new day. It's yes. a new time. It's a new way. And as soon as she starts to cry, back in her. Yes. So it was all morning, really. She was just back in her bed c- continually. Yeah. And the mom, poor mom, was in the kitchen thinking, oh, they're abandoning my child. But, but she trusted us enough yeah. not to interfere. Yeah. But it was just... You could tell oh, how this kid had, manip- I mean, manipulated and yeah, yeah, pulling on her heartstrings. Yeah. And, yeah. But eventually, we asked, kind of coaxed mom to come in and to pay attention, and yeah. and she did. And since then, I asked my son. I said, "Has your wife changed her parenting style since that day?" Yeah. And uh, he said, "Yeah. He thought that it was that she was she was tougher now. Yeah. She was willing to put limits on her child." Which is what you have to do. This is anyway. I went way over. No, no, no. This, this it's 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 an amazing segue because we're going to move into segment two, um, but on, on two themes: willfulness and contemplation. And, right. And which, which is interesting because it it fits into in a different way the narrative we're going to open about your story with health and so on. So, segment two: willfulness and control. On an episode of the Tammy Peterson podcast, you confided this quote. My mother had a rough childhood. She wasn't very trusting, was kind of nervous, so that made me nervous. So when I left home, I felt that I was going to be somebody who could take care of my own destiny, who could make my own decisions. I was the one who was in control and who would get myself out of tight spots. That worked for quite a long time, end quote. But then it didn't. Right. Because in 2019, after a trip to Croatia with your sister, you returned home to get some tests for what was reasonably considered a travel-related illness. Because answers were a bit elusive, your physician ordered an imaging study. I think it was an abdominal ultrasound. Yeah. Tell us what happened next. Well, they saw a shadow on my kidney. And what did that mean? So what would that was? This they be- didn't know what it meant. So I had to, we had gone, I don't remember. We were on tour. Yeah. I had to fly home in the middle of the tour for a biopsy. This is Jordan's book tour at the time yep. you were on. Yeah. Yeah. And then flew back to meet him. And they came back and said, oh, I had renal cell carcinoma. And that I didn't really have to rush home because it was not going to be that dangerous uh, uh, to my health Mm. if I waited a little bit. So it was uh, March, the end of March the next year that I had that first surgery. And they took a partial, uh, a a half, a half of my kidney away. Yeah. So you have this, uh, you have this surgery, you've you've got this diagnosis or this imaging points towards a a particular diagnosis, you're you're a certain amount of reassurance about timing, go about the tour, come back, have the partial resection of the surgery called a partial nephrectomy. You go into follow up to see your doctor. Yeah, I'd spent six weeks getting well, I was walking from where we lived in central Toronto down to the waterfront. I don't know how far that is. But it was probably an hour walk and I was, so I wasn't getting in great shape and I started to get some flank pain Mm -hmm. here. Uh, And I told the doctor and that's the only symptom of a Bellini tumor. So there are, there are hardly any symptoms of this cancer that 
kills everybody. So this is, and, and that's, that's that's the post. Op. Yes. So you so so you're sitting with him in the in the you're going to just see him as a post operative follow up, and and I think as you described previously, he he looks very nervous. He, the, the he, doctor, was, he was he was shaking, ashen, and and so on. Yeah. And he's telling you what does he tell you? He tells me that uh, actually what I had was not what they said it was. Yeah. That what I had was terminal, and I had ten months to live, and that there was no treatment for it, only surgery. And he was trying to get me to sign sign the papers, which I did. But I noticed how uh, he was so nervous. Yeah. He was so nervous, and of course I didn't know what he anything about what he was talking about except for when he gave me this prognosis. And in my way of being the person who was in control, I said, okay, 10 months to live. Mm. But I realized, and, and I've been thinking about why, why did I say that? Yeah. You know, why did I say that? I lived my life with some self-doubt, mm -hmm. I think. That's why I needed control because I had some self-doubt. Self and some cynicism, too, which may have started back when I was 17. The pool. The pool. <laughs> yeah. My dad he drank okay. uh, socially. So people would come to his office at the end of the day with a bottle, and he would drink with them mm -hmm. and then come home. And my mother just worried at home all the time. And I was five years younger than my next sibling. So by the time I was 12, I was home alone with my mom and dad. And so, and there, the, the drinking and the distrust didn't really surface for my three siblings who were older than me. Right. So this was my time of being at home. Sure. That was my experience. And uh, it it stopped me from being trust mm. trusting too. She, my mom kind of turned me against my dad mm -hmm. at that time, you know, with what she was thinking. Right. And I was at home and he wasn't as present as he should have been. So he wouldn't have clued into what I was learning mm -hmm. from my mother. And no, and it's no wonder she could have gone. I, later, I thought, why didn't she just go to the office and say it's time to go home? Right. But but she didn't have that uh, authority as far as she was concerned. So by the time I grew up, I had, and lots of people do this. You know, about thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. You decide who you're going to be, right. and that's how you leave home. And if you don't update that, that's who you're going to be. It kind of freezes a little bit. I Thir mean, you, you know, look at Justin Trudeau. We think he's about sixteen, so he never. Updated. Graduated Is, beyond, yeah. No, yep. not a bit. So, so, so the, you're having this, this terrible news being broken to you. Jordan is with, with you at the, the doctor's appointment. Yes. And, and you're both dumbstruck. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're driving home and, and, and I'm going to get into, into the drive home and then your encounter with your son and your daughter in just a few minutes. I want, I want to circle back though for a minute to the younger Tammy, the Tammy who asserted she was in control. The Tammy who mm -hmm. said she could take care of her own destiny. When was this the moment you discovered that that philosophy, that philosophy of determined self-reliance, while it had helped you in many ways, it wasn't perfect? Was was the, would you say this moment where you're being told this is a different cancer than we thought, a Bellini, uh, a Bellini tumor? And for those who are, I, I practice medicine, so I'll just simply say, renal cell carcinoma is a common cancer in the kidney, and if it's small and confined to the capsule of the kidney, it's a low grade. It can get large in the kidney and still be low grade, be resected, and have a good prognosis. The Bellini tumor, who I've I've since spoken with a couple of my clinician colleagues as we've talked about this. Um, one of whom is a is a very seasoned oncologist who was not familiar with this, and the other one was well, urologist had just diagnosed his first one in his career. He'd been practicing for twenty five years. The other day, and 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 uniformly, when these are diagnosed, they present with with distant metastases. The prognosis is yes. is very very grim. Yes. <clears throat> so you're grappling with this. Was this, and not that you were thinking about it in this way, but was this a moment where, sort of, the the ground shook from beneath you? That ground that was all about. I can control this or, or, or was I that? I don't know. I don't know. So, I don't know. It, it, I didn't really feel, I didn't really feel that shaken up. Okay. The doctor was shaken up. Yeah. My husband was shaken up. But you were I, like, I was, I can, okay. I, right. I can do this yeah. because yeah. I can always do whatever. That's, that was my philosophy. Um, but then I came home and uh, we were outside. I remember we were outside. So we must've gone over to my son's house, which they used to live right just right down the street. Mm. They moved during COVID down to the lakefront where they can be by the beach. Right. But I went over there and uh, 
he's he's been such a good person. Michaela was very sick. He was always very supportive. Even when he was a high school student, you know, he'd come home. He'd come home. He didn't. He didn't stray. Mm. So, he was like a rock for me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Jordan's my good friend and everything, but he's not my son. Yeah. And there's something, there's something about I think a, a son's love for his mother because when I told him and I looked, he looked at me. Oof! I saw. Such pain. Yeah. And I know as we right now, I, I can just, I can see it. I can see it in your eyes. And, and I know. It, it was a lot. Yeah. But, you know, I'm so grateful for that, though. Yeah. Very funny. But, you know, right then, I, uh, I felt the weight come. I felt like an angel was just pulling the weight of the, world off my shoulders and I felt it physically and I realized all of a sudden I said to him you know what the doctor's just a man he had an opinion uh but he doesn't know if I'm going to live or die God's going to know that and only God knows that mm -hmm. and so we'll we'll take this one step at a time yeah with Gratitude. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and it was a sea change of. It was a momentary. It, it was. It was a. I don't know what you call it. it I, I was. Um, what do you call that? I don't know. An epiphany or. or okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was. It was such strange. And I've thought about it and thought about it. And I do believe that he loved me more than I loved myself. Oh. And that was that cynicism that I'd been carrying around. And, and that self doubt that lifted off my Amazing. shoulders. I. If I may, because I want to, I'm gonna, I want to go into this that a moment of grace, if you will, in that yeah. trans transformation. I want to stay for, if not yeah. that I want to stay too long in this, because I want to move on to the grace side of things. Um, you've described yourself in the past as willful. Yes. Um, and I, there's mm -hmm. a lot of people out there that in this day and age, it's all about self assertion and you know, yes. s set your mind to things, and, and and there's there's a lot of virtue to that, there setting is. goals and and self discipline and and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and so on and so forth. Um, so some might say, is there a problem in being assertive and seeking control and 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 asserting control and so on amidst the vicissitudes of life? Um, what did you mean about your? What did you discover about your own willfulness um, in this? Uh, this circumstance. What what did you learn about uh, your your sense of control and your and your sense that you don't have control? Well, I've learned quite a bit. It's been four years now. Yeah. So um, I did start, you know, a, a prayer practice. I had done a lot of yoga and a lot of meditation, so a prayer practice was was easy because I'd done yoga every day. Yeah. So I already had a practice uh, of reflection, but it was nonverbal, mm -hmm. right? Because it was yoga, it was nonverbal. It was colors and light and things like that, but it wasn't. It wasn't scripture. Yeah. So when I began to pray the rosary, and we did that in the hospital with a friend who came to see me. Um, first of all, I learned to pray the rosary because I hadn't known how, and she taught me, and I continued with that, and it's really started some reflection yeah. for me. Ask me the question again. Uh, yeah, yeah, just what, what did you learn about your own willfulness? Oh, yeah. And, you know, how much had that been a, a dominant theme in your life? Mm -hmm. And what was it like to <laughs> sort of recognize, I, my, I, I can't necessarily will my, my way out of this conundrum. Yeah. And also, I don't necessarily have the control. I mean, there's a, there's a certain um, surrender that, that kind of comes. And again, yeah, we're, we're... Surrender. We're and I'm sure that God had tried many times before. We all can be... <laughs> <laughs> have the door knocking and we have our earplugs in. You yes, know, so. that's right. Like yeah. me when I have a thought and I'd say bug off to my thoughts. Not not a thought, like maybe an inspiration yeah. even, and I'd yeah. still say bug off we to that. We just disregard. Because whatever I thought wasn't worthwhile. Yeah. That's, that's how I had learned. I had learned that that was my role is to be, I guess, of service, mm. but not to not including who I was going to be tomorrow and the next day and, and years later, because that service to others 
is you in the future as well as others. And I wasn't, I hadn't, I hadn't put that in, which is a, um, a recipe for disaster, really, because I, and I don't know what you think of this. So this is kind of random, but it's a thought that I've had. So I'm going to present it. Um, so I had cancer and before the night before the surgery, we were so scared. Jordan and I were sitting watching TV and neither of us were in the room. We were so scared. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I said, I think we got to meditate, you know, and I did this once in my twenties cause mm. I had another scare and I was taught this meditation to go there and look at it. So we went upstairs and he sat at my feet and went up and down the, um, the arch of my foot with his fingers like this, just up and down in a very rhythmical manner. And I imagined light coming in. And then I thought, well, we need gold light because this is cancer. So I breathed in gold light and I took it down to where the kidney was and I talked to it. You know, I said, uh, what's your problem? You can talk to me. Don't be afraid. Like if you're afraid, we're not going to be able to move forward. And I saw these cells that were, it, it was as if your cells face you mm. and these ones were turned away. These ones were turned away and there was, and this was over about two hours. To, to see this, yeah. uh, I thought, oh, I can't talk to these. Mm. They're gone. Like they have, they have deserted me. And I've thought later what that desertion means. Mm. And in more Eastern philosophies, they say problems with your kidney are problems with um, not being an advocate of yourself. And I thought, yeah, that's what I've done. I've not been an advocate of myself. And I kind of, I wonder if if your spirit, because your spirit is everywhere in your body, if you have turned away from yourself so much, I mean, there's other people out there that haven't turned away from God yeah. or they haven't turned away from what's divine in them. Mm -hmm. If you turn away from what's divine in you, does your body turn away from you? Do, you? do your cells start to just not perform? Because why why perform if the guidance isn't holy? Yeah. Yeah. So it's I don't a, know. That's quite a strange it's thought. A, no, it's a great question. And I, I, and I will say, I think as a physician also working with so many patients, I can say that there is a lot to be said about um, where they are um, in terms of their soul's health uh, in tandem with where they are in their physical health. Um, and I, I think there are, this is, we are delving into the deeply kind of the mystical sides. And I think the, the, the Catholic Christian side of, of this, there's profound um, spaces of, of deep health and unhealth in those interior spaces that can manifest beyond the soul's wellness or sickness to the body's uh, wellness and sickness. And, mm -hmm. and as we move into where your illness will go, I think there's miraculous manifestations of God's providence in the midst of things that like, uh, things right. like good this. and bad. Good yeah. and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and one thing I want to say too, the night when you're doing, when you're, when you're, when you're doing this kind of, uh, you know, envisioning meditative exercise with Jordan the, the night before the surgery, just so people know, this is surgery number two. Yeah. where you're going in and they're going to resect the rest of, of the kidney and lymph nodes in, in the, the regional lymph. area because this has to be jumped on. This is a very, again, grim prognosis. And, and there's so much that was weighing on you both that night before you kind of go in, into this into the situation. Yeah. Hi, I'm Todd Warner, Managing Editor of Evangelization and Culture, the Journal of the Word on Fire Institute. Word on Fire is a global evangelical community that exists to provide our members with the resources they need to proclaim Christ to a secular culture. Our award-winning quarterly journal, Evangelization and Culture, is offered exclusively to Word on Fire Institute members. It's a tangible representation of our mission and goal to lead with beauty in order to bring others to the knowledge of truth. Inside each issue, you'll find writing from premier scholars and inspiring pieces on literature, culture, and daily life from fellow missionaries on the journey to know and serve Christ. Get a copy of the current issue of the Evangelization and Culture Journal for free by visiting wordonfire.org slash journal. Thank you and join us in bringing Christ to a hungry culture. Segment three, illness and the crucifix. I'm gonna quote 
your words back to you that you just said to me, but I want to I wanted to say them again and have you kind of reflect on them. When I got that terminal, that terminal illness prognosis, you recalled on your podcast, I was thinking on the way home, I'm 57. I've had many aunts and uncles who died in their 50s. Maybe I'm one of them too. So I can accept that. I've lived a good life. I've always thought I was a tough person, could do whatever I wanted to do. And I decided I would make this decision as well. Yeah. But when I got home and told my son and my daughter, the looks on their faces made me think, "Uh uh-oh, maybe I'm not thinking about this right. This isn't about me. Mm -hmm. This is about my loved ones. I'm here for them and they need me. That's why people go through all this treatment. And you described some of the really intense treatments people go through, sometimes ghastly treatments. And, and And you were saying... I, it, it dawned on me that's why so many people go through these very, very difficult treatments in part or if not in whole because of the people they love, because they discover I can't, I, I, I would be okay with dying. I don't want to die. I'd be okay with dying, but I need to live for these other people who I know it will hurt so deeply. Yeah. And this, you concluded, is a whole different story than I thought at the beginning. Yeah. So, so I was going to say, how did this epiphany that we've just covered and I've just kind of kind of packaged for you again... How did that moment, you looked into your son and daughter's faces and told them the news, how did that change you going forward and, and, and how you confronted cancer? You talk about the prayer. Maybe you could, could you elaborate a little bit on, on how that changed you? Sure. Uh, I pretty much, when I was in the hospital, I was cold because mm. I had lost all the weight I could lose, really. So I had nothing to keep me warm. And my family was around me and they got me a, a wool toque and a, big wool uh, duvet, and I had wool pants on and hockey socks. My son gave me his hockey socks, and I had a hot water bottle. And that at night, I could I could at least be comfortable. Somewhat warm, yeah. Yeah, but I spent the night praying uh, the Lord's Prayer mm. pretty much all night long and all day long. I just prayed the, the Lord's Prayer all the time. And when I'd go in for scans, and they were starting to, like, uh, get me ready. Yeah. And some of them were very painful, especially the last one. I can't remember what it was for now, but whoa. And, uh, but I just prayed. I just prayed furiously through all of that. Yeah. And I was okay. Right. Because of that, I couldn't stand it, but I could stand it if I prayed. I want to ask you, cause there's people out there listening that are watching that are suffering from cancer, from yeah. grim prognoses. What did you pray? If you don't mind me, I know it's a very personal question. You can say that's between me and God. Was this for healing? Was this for coping? Was this for the for your family? Was it all of the above? Uh, would you would you be able to to confide that? And again, it's very personal. So no, I don't mind, but I don't know if I've thought about it like that. Um, you know, my when I finally was back in the hospital and there for a very long time, five weeks long. Uh, my my family came every day. That's hard. I know it's hard. They came every day, and uh, uh, I don't know. I was so grateful, you know. And so I let gratitude lead the way, really. I've let gratitude lead the way ever since. And I remind myself often that what I, where I am and what I'm doing, I have to be grateful for. Yeah. And uh, I think that when I prayed, I was praying the Lord's Prayer. I was praying. I was praying, praying to endure this. I was just praying to be able to uh, put myself forward so these people could help me, even though it was very uncomfortable and the prayer helped me to uh, you know not be bitter yeah. i mean doctors right you know they're they're doing their work and it's delicate work and i didn't think it would be helpful for me to interfere and you know over the years actually when i think of that i learned not to interfere in jordan's work mm. so i had practiced that I had practiced that if his he was up in his office and the door was closed, that the door was closed. Mm-hmm. And if I had a question or something during the day, it wasn't the right time to add, ask ask it. I would knock and tell him when dinner was ready. That was reasonable. But 
But other than that, there was hardly anything that was reasonable mm -hmm. to interfere with that. So I didn't want to interfere with the doctors. And I had decided I would be grateful for all the help. And so, so I prayed. I prayed for perseverance, really. Perseverance, I think, is what I prayed for. Mm. Uh, I don't think I prayed to get well, really. Mm -hmm. No, I think I prayed for perseverance through this and faith that if I persevered, uh, they would do their best, yeah. these doctors that were helping me, and I would find a way forward. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And I know it's very personal, so thank you for confirming. Oh, that's all right. I wanted to ask you, um, when you launched the Tammy Jordan podcast in 2022, yeah. I was struck by the recurrence of several themes and their accompanying mm -hmm. images um, that you discussed specifically with the celebrated iconographer and editor, Jonathan Peugeot, who's a friend of ours at Word on Fire. The themes were suffering, crucifixion, the wounds of Christ. Mm -hmm. These are searing topics, right? These are troubling images. Some people might say, oh, why do we want to spend time in these dark places and so on? But I, I totally get it. Uh, but I want to ask you from your perspective, why did these searing topics resonate so fully with you? Well, I'd been praying the rosary, trying to understand it, reading the gospels that went with every uh, mystery. You know, I was really trying to, but I, but I needed some guidance. And so I asked Jonathan if he'd do some podcasts with me on the rosary. And I think probably it was my brush with death that made me so interested in Christ's death and resurrection that and I wanted to know everything about it and the things I didn't know about were those things yeah what were those wounds about what was that cross why was he up there on that cross what did that mean what was the crown of thorns what was the lashing what was all of that yeah and although it describes that in the rosary when you pray it describe it describes some of that it's pretty I mean, the whole Bible's in that rosary, yeah. so it's pretty compact. Yeah. So you don't get a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. And I wanted all the detail. Yeah. And I want all the detail of transformation, I think, because I felt like I had a transformation. It's so stunning to me, um, again, in my, my line of work, uh, outside of Word on Fire, and, and your story and all the stories, there's there's immense amount of suffering out there. Immense. Yes. Um, Mm. What is it? And it's dawned on me after years of practice, um, and formerly a Lutheran, now Catholic, mm. uh, to look at a cross with Christ on the cross, as opposed to an empty cross, for me has a completely, prof a profoundly different meaning because it reminds me that not only do we have a God, but we have a God that suffers with us mm. and for us. And the notion of a God that isn't aloof, isn't a wind up the clock and set it loose isn't a person that or a, an entity that kind of moves us around like pawns but actually got down into the grit and the mire of what of, of our human existence taught us immense bouts of wisdom uh, and insights healed people formed innumerable mir miracles but in the end suffered um that makes whatever degree of suffering i have I, it sounds like the degree of suffering you had others that are struggling with their own suffering it makes us know we are not alone in the most cosmic way possible. And that's a profound, that's a profound reality that I'll tell you coming into the Catholic faith, I, I was haunted by, but absolutely, um, I would say obsessed with, but I could not get enough of George Bernard no or Flannery O'Connor's writings because they were so raw and they could sometimes be so grim. And yet it was in the most raw, most grim, most suffering laden narratives <clears throat> that grace penetrated so brightly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's so, so it's, it's interesting. I, it, uh, the next question I was going to ask you is, um, does a suffering God make a difference to you as opposed to God? Just is, is, does a suffering God add that much more to your sense of intimacy with God than just the fact that he's God himself? Does the suffering component resonate that much more with you? Well, I think that um, because Je the Jesus story is so human mm -hmm. in uh, and right down to death. So it's very human. 
it's hard to understand. Yeah. Uh, God is... It's kind of here. I hear I hear God's voice now. You know, I can I can hear my better self sometimes. And that's what I think of my relationship with God is that God is listening and he's paying attention and if we ask he will tell us. I think of that as God, Jesus. I think of Jesus as, uh, and his, his crucifixion and his resurrection as happening all the time in my life. It's happening all the time because when I'm in self-will, when I'm in, uh, when I'm making things happen, uh, now I realize that and have to humble myself. And so to humble yourself, you have to let, you have to let that go. You have to, but you can't, it's hard to let that go. So, you know, I will pray and I'm, I'll pray maybe a quick prayer, like thy, thy will be done mm -hmm. or let go and let God or something like that until I can, or now I pray the Jesus prayer. Yeah, That's a really good one. Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me. A I'm a sinner. Yeah. And when I do that, I can bring myself down to, I can bring myself down to low enough mm -hmm. so that I can feel God's presence again. Yes. Because I can't feel it if I'm on top of the world. Yeah. And so I know that. I know that I'm in kind of a purgatory when I'm in self-will. Yeah. And that that humbling experience of letting that go as soon as I let that go uh it's better yeah yeah you know it's better as soon as you realize that you're a sinner and what you're doing is sinful if you re recognize that at every moment if you can try to stay present with that it, it can be glorious you remind me of the your granddaughter crying and crying in the crib mm -hmm. and the self -will. right and then when there comes a time of there's going to be some suffering because we're not going to attend to your every whim here comes the contemplation and then later comes the joy. Yes. And, and it's, 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 if, if that's not us kind of in a nutshell, uh, what you're, you know, I want it my way. I want it my way. I want it yeah, my way. Yeah. And at the end I need that contemplation and ultimately I arrive at a point of joy. It's interesting too, because this to me, the Pieta, Mary cradling mm -hmm. the, 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 the body of her now dead son, the Christ, that moment of extreme suffering wedded with a moment of extreme interiority of extreme contemplation. It is in, in the midst of that, I could see, imagine the tears flowing and so on, but that picture of Mary in profound mix of suffering, but a profound, um, deep space of contemplation, prayer, et cetera. It's, it's that bridge from the suffering side to the ultimate joyous side of, of, res, of the resurrection. Um, it's so I just you made me think about that with the, with your yeah you have to give up absolutely yeah, everything. everything and what does a woman not want to give up is her son that's right. you know so that's why that's why it's her son because that is you have to give up your kids or you can't even see them yeah. you know if you're not giving up your kids and and then also not just giving them up but also recognizing that they have their own relationship with the world mm -hmm. uh, and an own, their own div divinity to contend with. And it's not up to me to be trying to direct that. Yeah. I'll just get in the way. Yeah. Segment four, Grace in the Rosary. Mm -hmm. Anglican, Anglican priest Robert Llewellyn once observed, Quote, the words of the rosary are like the banks of a river, and the prayer is like the river itself. The banks are necessary to give direction to keep the river flowing, but it is the river with which we are concerned. So in prayer, it is the inclination of the heart to God, which alone matters. As the river moves into the sea, the banks drop away. So too, as we move into the deeper sense of God's presence, the words fall away, and we shall be left in silence in the ocean of God's love. 
end quote. Tammy, tell us a little bit more about when you started praying the rosary. You mentioned it about in the hospital. How did it come about? So um, there was, when Jordan was first more public in his speeches and people knew who he was, a young woman named Queenie Yu and uh, another woman named Tanya, I can't remember her last name. She was running for office in, in the city and they were both advocating to try to bring the schools away from all of this ideology that's happening. Mm. And Jordan listened. And they and they were uh, grateful for any help that they could get. And so I, I had met her before. But I and then she would she would do things like maybe bring a gift over or something now and then. Just very she wasn't pushy yeah. or anything like that. And when I went into the hospital, she showed up one day. It's okay. <laughs> she showed up one day about 10 in the morning with a rosary for me. She said, do you want to pray the rosary? And I said, yeah, I do. And Toronto General Hospital has a an atrium on the fourth floor that goes up as high as the building which is quite high and it's just full of trees and benches and people go there if you can get there you yeah. go there and so we went there every day for mm. five weeks she came at 10 in the morning every day every day for five weeks wow. and it would i would pray for two hours wow and cry no and that's all i did was i cried yeah. and told stories about my family and all the things that i was going to miss yeah yeah, it was good. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's, it's wetted with tears of joy and tears of pain as you kind of look back on that. It sounds like it was absolutely transformative because I think as I understand it, that has been, the rosary has been a part of your effectively daily prayer life from that point forward. Is that is that fair to say? When I was well, I'd been well for months, my cousin contacted me and we've grown apart and it's too bad because her family was really pivotal in my childhood. And she said, I didn't know you were sick. I'm sorry, one of my kids told me. And uh, I said, yeah, that was okay, I was better. And she said, I'm gonna send you something. And I said, okay. And I think we went on tour, <laughs> as we had been. And I came home and there in the mail, months later, mm. I found this letter and I opened it and it was a rosary. It was a rosary, it was my great grandmother's rosary. Wow. Uh, I met my great grandmother when she was, I remember her when she was 104. Mm. So she lived to be old, old Polish mm. Catholic lady. And she kept that rosary every day of her life and then gave it to my grandmother who kept it with her. And when my grandmother died, she gave it to my cousin and my cousin gave it to me. What a grace for that to arrive in the mail. Yeah, that's for sure. Is that still part I didn't of even really, I didn't really understand my family heritage and I thought oh I'm Catholic I didn't know that <laughs> right yeah <laughs> and 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 does yeah. that does that did do you pray using that that very rosary oh I have yeah. I have but since then people they give me rosaries yeah. everywhere I yeah. go yeah I was at the presidential debate yeah <laughs> so weird eh? so you're at the present and you're trying to decide where to sit and we had two places we could sit but we chose this one and so we all sit down, and these this girl right in front of us is part of the Young Americans group. It's a big, big group on the Republican side. And the fellow who was sitting beside her turned to me, and he said, here, he said, uh, this rosary's been blessed by the Pope. I oh want you to have gosh. this. Just right, like right that. Right there. <laughs> yeah, just like that. Well, thank you. <laughs> but that's just how often I receive rosaries. I receive rosaries from everyone. And uh, I couldn't think of anything uh, better to get than, so than a rosary. That's that's good. Tell me, so in in it's it's an amazing story of of this this person that came and devoted morning yeah. after morning after morning, and what it meant for you in terms of the practice because you're learning to pray the rosary in that, yes. in this process, but also reflection with her tears of joy, tears of anticipation, tears of fear, um, and so on which has then kind of made its way into a daily practice. And we'll talk about what your prayer practice is right now. What is, when, you, when you think upon the rosary with the Hail Marys and Our Fathers and the Apostles' Creed and Glory Bees and, and, and the Mysteries and so on, 
What has it meant to you? Oh, well, um, I've been searching for what to pray for mm. in a deep way. And so I, I, I've read all the scripture that goes along with all the mysteries. And uh, I started following the uh, Benedictine College. Mm -hmm. They have really nice um, explanation or meditations, mm -hmm. meditations after each mystery. And when I read through the meditations, I can find something there usually. Yeah. And then I can, and then, and then I start by praying for that. I start by praying for that, and it goes to people. Mm. Uh, when I first started praying the rosary, can we go into that? Please. When we first started praying the rosary, I prayed for, um, I prayed kind of globally, mm -hmm. universally almost, for quite a long time. Oh, no, no, that's not what I did. I started by praying for each one of my family members. Gotcha. And, and friends, and I could pray, and I prayed one bead for, for each, each person. Oh, great. Like, that's a lot of people. I was going to say, and you probably moved to <laughs> third cousins and so on. So it was after, yeah, you know. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. And then I started praying for not only my family members, but anyone I'd ever fought with, anyone I'd ever despised, you know. I saw then, and then political figures would mm. came from that. And then it started to be more universal, where for the sick, but I would put my father in that because he's 92 and in a nursing home. And I'd put my sister in that because she's 68 and has dementia. Mm. And so I, I put my suffering but made it universal to a prayer for all the suffering in the world. And, and so there, you know, that would be with the uh, sorrowful mystery. But then the, the joyous mystery, I pray for everybody. and. I really do try to make sure that I am intending it outwards. And and um, Queenie, you taught me that. She, she would just say, okay, we're going to pray this mystery. Who do you want to pray for? Mm -hmm. She'd just say, who do you want to pray yes. for? And so then I'd you know, choose my mother or something, and then I'd cry through the whole thing. Yeah. That's <laughs> but, good. But she always had me have an intention you know she she was teaching me how to do this yeah. in a in a good way and i've continued to practice in that way uh i know that just praying the rosary without going outside of myself is wrong yeah feels wrong yeah the the thing about the rosary too is you, as you've said it it's an amazing for as a once upon a time a non-catholic who became catholic yeah. it is it is a profoundly scriptural I mean, I mean, it's yeah, the mysteries it's, are the stories of of Christ and of Mary. The the Hail Mary is the words out of uh, out of uh, I think it's Elizabeth's uh, mouth. Uh, the glory be the Our Father. The words of Christ. I mean, it's a it's 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 almost a uh, it's a scriptural recapitulation for someone who never read the Bible. If you if you haven't mm -hmm, read the Bible, mm -hmm. you can learn the mysteries and these prayers, and all of a sudden you're immersed in this this profound history um, rooted in the Gospels. Um, I think it's extraordinary. St. Francis de Sales said the greatest method of praying is to pray the rosary. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Padre Pio called the rosary his weapon against the powers of hell. And Archbishop Fulton Sheen insisted that the rosary is the, the power of the rosary is beyond description. As you've integrated the rosary further into your life and other prayers, as you just mentioned, the Jesus prayer or, or other short prayers and so on, um, how have you seen the fruits of prayer in your life? Well, my kids have told me that I, my disposition has changed. Mm. Jordan said I'm more like a child. Uh, he said that's remarkable. He said that, that <laughs> he said that's remarkable. Somebody of your age can transform yeah. like that. He said because you have transformed into uh, a laughing kind and generous person and that is who i was when i was a child wow. i just i had such a good time <laughs> i want to say to people who haven't listened to the tammy uh peterson podcast my introduction to it i listen to you and, and all I, what i hear is a profound kindness and joy e episode after episode after episode and is it is rooted in um prayer uh, prayer contemplation and listening that that just suffuses each episode so I, I've come to know you in this stage, but I'm like, well, that sounds like the way you've always been. But of course, yeah, I've no, just, I've just, not all the way. Yeah. No, yeah. no, listening. Yeah. I've learned a lot about listening and traveling with Jordan on yeah. tour. And I think about 
and negotiation, listening and negotiation. Le- negotiation, you can tell if you've negotiated enough mm. because a sense of play emerges yeah. between you. And part of the problem people are having now is they won't listen to one another oh. and they won't negotiate. So they they never get to the dance. No. You know, they're always stuck in the in the um in the argument. Mm. They're always just stuck in the argument. That that can go so much further and be so much and can be redemptive. But you have to you have to be humble. So you have to Admit you don't know what's going on and that you're open to finding uh, information out. You have to be that way or you can't, you don't, you can't negotiate uh, in good faith. The humility is a theme that comes up again and again in your podcast. And, and it's interesting, I think about the absolute humility. Again, we move from a willful, I control my own destiny. I, I can take care of things. I will get myself out of jams and so on to a abject surrender in the face of a terminal diagnosis. Um, and you're lying in a hospital bed with a person you don't know very well, who walks you into the, the, the tradition of prayer of the rosary. It takes an incredible amount of humility to, to, to go from one of that, that former to the latter. And yet look how much you, as yourself, as you're describing yourself, look how much you've changed. Well, my father, my mother had prefrontal dementia. Okay. And uh, probably when she was about 50, she started showing, we didn't know if it was depression or uh, anxiety, uh, agoraphobia. We didn't know what what it was, Uh, but she died when she was 75. So it was a 25-year decline, which my sister is now going through exactly the same thing. Oh, man. But my other sister is a palliative care nurse. And my sister lives with her. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, wow. That's a grace. Isn't that so? And a lot of prayer coming her way, too. Well, yeah. my my sister moved from Vancouver to Vancouver Island as my dad was aging because she knew she wanted to be of service there. And she has been. He got to stay at home, like, right till last Christmas, actually. He's always been at home. But my father, when my mom became ill, uh, you know, he was what people would describe as a man about town. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of guy he was. He was always playing golf or curling, um, even like right up into his late eighties. Sure. He was, and he had a group of friends and very extroverted guy. In fact, my sister said that she asked my dad, didn't ask my mom so much because we didn't know what was wrong with her. So by the time we would think of asking her questions, she had lost her uh, sense of speech. That's what they lose first. And so living three thousand miles away, I completely lost contact with her. Mm. Some one time she called and there was nothing, nothing there, and I knew it was her. Yeah. And she sent me uh, uh, the Lord's prayer. Uh, the Lord's prayer. She sent me uh, the prayer with the shepherds. The I don't know. I can't remember what it's called. Yeah. But the Lord is my shepherd. Oh yeah. I shall yeah, not want. Yeah. yeah. So, Psalm twenty two. Yep. Yeah, she sent that to wow. me. Yeah. And my mom wasn't much of a uh, communicator. When I got letters from mom, I would just. I'd have the letter and I'd give it to my husband and I'd tell him what it said. Yeah. Because it was just the day-to-day stuff. Yeah. But she sent me letters all the time. She was great. Anyway, my dad, he he reined himself in, started carrying a backpack with a diaper in it and a change of clothes. And um, he was still working for my brother, getting paid $10 an hour, uh, checking wood stoves that had been installed to see if he could they could be insured because my mm. My brother had gone in my father's footsteps and opened an insurance business. And uh, he took my mom in the car and she would just sit along with him. He just took, he, he just took her everywhere and he was just with her all the time. And if, if we came home, I, I would go visit and try to make sure that everything was okay. And uh, at one point we put, le- we put letter, we put words, mo- hundred most common words on the fridge and we could point to them to her and then we could kind of communicate sure. with her. And we put a little uh, recording in the bathroom and it was my dad's voice so that she could get to the toilet. Now wait, Bethy, wait, wait, wait. So every time uh, you uh, went in the bathroom, uh, dad was uh, saying, now uh, wait, 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 wait till you sit down. Oh so, my. so cute, but yeah. so cute. And we gave and we gave them a big, long electronic clock mm. that you could put messages on. So when she was still not too bad, 
but didn't know where he was, he'd write, gone golfing home at three. Wow. And it would scroll. Wow. Over and know? over again. For yeah. Her, yeah. And then and then we put um, alarms on the doors because she snuck out one night and yeah. went into the motorhome and we didn't know where she was. And so, you know, so we tried to keep up with things. And no matter what we suggested my for my dad to do, mm-hmm. he would just do it. Wow. You know, I came one one March on my birthday in March. I used to go visit my parents and thank them. And uh, I got there and my dad says, I don't know if I can take care of your mother anymore. She is so uh, paranoid. Mm. She thinks that I'm having dates with secretaries in your son in my son's office, mm. you know. And I, I, he said, I don't know if I can do this. And we had given mom Ritalin at the beginning, sure. hoping that that would help her to keep speaking. Mm-hmm. But it made her paranoid. Oh. So I, I said to dad, just with a, an inkling of thought, I said, T- you're taking care of her. Yeah. It's up to you if you want to take her off all these drugs because she was on whatever they have prescribed for yeah. dementia and yeah. all of that. Yeah. And I said, if you want to take her off all that stuff, it's your call. Mm-hmm. There's nobody who's going to judge you. Yeah. You're here. This is your burden. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he, t- so he listened. Yeah. And he took her off all the medication and she was way calmer and just way more she was just funny mom was completely quiet and if but she had a slapstick humor so if somebody banged their head on something she'd laugh (laughs) away thought that was really funny in her life she was such a controlling person of herself she wouldn't swim because her hairdo would get messed up and you know she was so tight and then as the dementia started, she started buying books off shelves. She would never let herself sit down and read because yeah. that wasn't duty. Yeah. Like she was very hard on herself. And she started taking art classes. That was very good. Reading books, just being more relaxed about who she was. And so there was this period of, of grace, even yes. in this, in, even in, in this time, it was as if she had controlled <laughs> things so much yeah. that eventually it broke down and she what was, was left was who she was. Yeah. By the way, I want to say something you said that was very amongst that story was so poignant to me was her calling you and there being no. Yeah. But see, the thing that strikes me is, you know, she's there and she knows in her own way. Yeah. You're there. Yeah. And the words, as much as you want them, as much as you're like, this is unfortunate. I'm sad. It's sad. And so on. But there's this communicate. There's a, this is a, this is a, a a call out of love that required no words. And 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 if that's not a little bit emblematic of those sunset years, the twilight years, as dementia kind of kind of consumes a person. Yeah. What a profound example of a grace that required no words. Yeah. You know, I, I, that's that's profound. I want to ask you, if I may, as we have, wind down our our final minutes, what does your prayer life look like now? Uh. Well. I pray as soon as I wake up in the morning. So, you know, I shower and then I pray. I go down. We have a porch that's enclosed in stained glass. And I like to go out there because it's uh, open to the world, but it's a, it, but it's a nice contained space, place. Yeah. And um, my husband hung, I, I'm a, an artist, so he hung some of my drawings behind it. So it's just this little couch. It has a sheepskin on it so it's nice and cozy Mm -hmm. and I have a candle and I have my rosary I just leave it there and I come down and I sit there and I pray and I look out I look out of the window and contemplate it's really it's really 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 very nice it's uh I don't know I like to be I like to be outside. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid, outside, I was always outside. My son's first words were outside. (laughs) I thought, yep, he's my son. And so I think that that's where I want to be is outside. But I don't pray outside very much. Sometimes I go for a walk and pray. Yeah. That's harder, though. Yeah. That's harder. It's it's better. It's better and more present uh, to sit and pray and the the end the the end of the prayer that time of meditation that time of saying god what do you have for me today that's how i end 
And then I look for the challenges of the day that God has shown me mm -hmm. so that I can answer to the call. And I take one step at a time. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I pray. Do you find the one thing I think that you've been able to do is in the midst of an incredibly busy schedule and also there's plenty of times you're away from home. You're away from that sacred space. Yes. How For all those who are listening out there that are contending with the schedule, my kids have to be in 40 different places at once. My job is demanding. I'm exhausted. I'm away from home. How do you keep your prayer life going in the midst of all the eccentricities of your daily life? Okay, this is kind of a funny story. So kind of a funny story. When Jordan and I were on the beginning of our last tour, he was still wasn't very well. And... We weren't sure how, well, I said I thought he could do it, so we did it. But we were out on tour, and he was getting sick again. And I didn't know what to do about it. He was having a hard time even just being on, he could go on stage, but barely, you yeah. know. And uh, so we were going to call the the whole tour off and reconvene if he got better. And I was really uncomfortable. And we were in Detroit, and I said, I'm going home. Toronto's only a very short flight. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't do this anymore. For what, how it's going, I, I can't do it. I'm going home. So I went home, and uh, I wanted to be on tour. I like being on tour. Mm -hmm. I like being the whole thing. I like the whole thing. But I couldn't do it watching him suffer like that. I couldn't do it. Because you've watched every, I mean, if I'm a, you're always, you've watched every one of his lectures. Yeah, I know. I sat in the crowd for the first tour and watched every lecture. I mean. They were all different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was That's devotion. But it's also, it's also hard if you see, you know, your husband and he's flagging in health. Oh, yeah. I just can't imagine. Yeah. It was, um, it was too much for me. So I went home and I said, in a prayer, I didn't realize it was a prayer though, at the time. But it definitely was a prayer. I said, what do I have to do to go back on tour? And I heard a voice that said, get your own hotel room. Get your own hotel room. And I thought, no, I can't do that. My husband won't love me anymore. And I thought, well, that's stupid. Of course he will. And that, But so I had these little thoughts. <laughs> you know, dialogue, that like... And then I phoned a friend that I confided in. And I said, I said, God told me to get my own hotel room. She said, good idea. <laughs> so I thought. Okay, if that's what I've been told, yeah. I phoned the assistant that we had and I said, book my own hotel room for the rest of the tour. Mm -hmm. And I went back on tour. And how did it go? I had been in the same hotel room as him. And so I finish earlier than him because he has a Q&A afterwards. Yeah. It's another 45 minutes. So I'm usually asleep when he gets there. And in the morning, I'd get up like in the dark, find my phone, my rosary, my clothes and go outside and pray or pray in the bathroom or something, you know, like this. And then he'd have podcasts. This was before he was affiliated with the Daily Wire. So he was doing podcasts just in the hotel room. And I'd sit to the side and read and stuff. I didn't realize what I was doing. I, I was putting my life aside again. Yeah. I was, And I have a terrible habit of putting my life aside. So when I went home and this thought came to get my own hotel room, I got my own tower. I opened the blinds yeah. in the morning. I prayed. I started booking podcasts again. Yeah. I was like, oh my goodness, what a what a silly thing. I have not been attending properly to myself. Yeah. And Jordan at first was a little bit, your own hotel room, eh? Hmm. What does that mean for me? You know? But what it means is that if we want to be together, we have to say so. Yeah. There's no expectations and no assumptions about uh, what our communication is going to be like. Mm -hmm. It has to be, we're in different rooms. It has to be scheduled, just like I've probably said on my podcast that we scheduled dates years and years ago when I first had Michaela, when he didn't think he was getting enough attention. I said, we need to schedule dates because I don't have any time. And we kept that date schedule for 35 years. You know, sometimes it would be once a week and not three times a week. But it was always time that we had together. And so we were used to doing that scheduling because that had been. So when we were in different hotel rooms, then we could schedule again, but in a more uh, 
I don't know, in a freer way, really, because I had my space and he had his space. Yeah. And he's learned now that when he comes back from the tour or back from the lecture, he's all wound up mm -hmm. and he can take his time. Mm -hmm. There's nobody sleeping there. He's not going. And George said, we, we're not traveling. We're living on the road. People don't live in one room. Right. Right. Well, you mentioned this. He, you know, he has a door that you would you would knock on when he was working during the day at home. Yeah. But but you would be outside the door doing your own thing, or you have this room where you'll go and pray. In your house, you have spaces to kind of lovingly get away from each other. Yes. And have your own, <laughs> do your own thing. Yeah. Is it any different, and is it isn't it any as as necessary, if not more necessary, when you're on the road to be able to kind of spread out and do that? And so I think it is. There's yeah. something to that voice. It sounds like. Yeah. So I sleep in my own room all the time now. Yeah. Unless it's completely not available. Yeah. And my husband has found I like him more. So he's he's willing to go sleep by himself because I like him You're more. giving ideas to all sorts of families out there. <laughs> I know. There might be a lot of double bookings going on out there. <laughs> well, Tammy, it, the, first of all, it's been a jo an absolute joy of a conversation. I want to ask you one last question. This is almost more for the benefit of our many listeners out there. Um, given the suffering you've endured and the wisdom you've gained what counsel would you offer to those who are undergoing their own form of suffering and their hope for something better? Okay, well, first of all, if someone has a chronic illness and nobody knows what to do about it, they've gone to specialists and, everybody, and it's confusing and they're not making any progress, go on the carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. One variable, meat, water, salt. That's all. It put you in ketosis, it takes away all the inflammation in your body. Mm. Inflammation, I think, comes from eating carbohydrates, too many carbohydrates. You know, you think about it. If you're out in the wilderness, what are you going to eat? Well, you're going to shoot an animal and eat it, and you're going to pick whatever berries you can find on the tree and dig whatever roots you can find. Just very minimal carbohydrates. Now, if I go into the grocery store, I walk around, the meat counter is there, you know, the dairy is there, maybe the flowers are there, and all these aisles, except for maybe the one with the cleaning solutions and the birthday cards, is all carbohydrates. Mm. We have a huge industry of carbohydrates, and so, and we've also been given the food pyramid that is Grains at the bottom. Yeah. And that was the Department of Agriculture that made that food pyramid, not the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, a lobbyist group that made that. And we all adhered to that. And now we have an obesity problem and a chronic, the chronic illnesses. Now I know, I didn't know before I had cancer. I had a cancer that kills everybody. Yeah. And it went from my kidney to one lymph node. Yeah. And it was moving slowly like a, Cancer should just slowly so that you can find it. And so now I know if you put yourself in ketosis, which is uh, no carbohydrates, like none, I have lots of people, and then, well, maybe mushrooms, you know, maybe, but no, just like just meat, um, especially if you're chronically ill, just lamb, because lamb isn't aged. And so that's a little less work for your body to do. There's this whole idea of aged beef. For some reason, we didn't have that when I was young. You just had a steak and it was fresh. Mm -hmm. But now they age it and they think that that's better. But um, I have found that uh, sick people can't digest them. So if you're going to eat meat, you want to eat fresher steaks. And we eat ruminant animals because they multiple stomachs mean you don't eat the food they eat. So you can eat that meat and water. And that's one variable. and uh, you have a lot of time to do other things mm. when you only eat meat because you get an air fryer and you cook up that steak and you're done. So there's no futzing around in the kitchen of chopping vegetables sure, and things sure, like sure. that, right? So it gives you more time mm -hmm. and you're chronically ill. So you probably don't have that much time. That's good time. Mm -hmm. So even for that reason, you can limit that time in the kitchen and take that rest of the time for yourself. And for yourself... I think the best thing I think the best thing you can do is start a prayer practice. Uh, it doesn't take any energy. Uh, Word on Fire has all of the rosaries, and I listen to 
Bishop Barron. Some days, you know, I'm distracted. Mm -hmm. And so I'll put on Bishop Barron so he can take me through. Yeah. And he does a great job of introducing each mystery. Right. And uh, so I recommend that as well. Um, the College of the Benedictine College has really good meditations that can go along with your rosary. There's lots of ways to take this. And that contemplation can free you from the incessant thinking that can go on and also be drag you down. It can really drag you down because we're kind of hard on ourselves mostly. You know, we might be hard on other people, but really we're mostly pretty hard on ourselves. I mean, who else could you dominate completely but, but yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> never thought about that way. That's a great point. Yeah. You so, know, And Benedict the Sixteenth, one of his great lines of love, he, say, he says, we can, no, we can no longer hear God. We have too many frequencies in our ears. Yes, that's right. And Montaigne said, he talked about a story, I think it was a story in one of his essays, talked about Socrates being told that this person went on a trip and the person was miserable on the whole trip and he came back and he was miserable all over the all over again. And, there, and the guy was like, I'm surprised this guy wasn't a better person after his vacation. And Socrates said, why would he have changed? He brought himself along with him. Meaning that, you know, we, we, we like you said, we dominate ourselves and some, oftentimes we dominate ourselves in, in a willful, selfish, yes. um, overly controlling way. And, yes. the, and the narrative of your story as we kind of, we kind of, kind of come full circle here, it's 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 striking. It's a striking story, of of uh, of of a life lived and and grown through and enjoyed, a life that maybe had a certain amount of willfulness and control, like so many of us do. A, pro a circumstance where you were dropped to your knees, at a, an introduction to prayer, and especially the rosary, a surrender and an openness to grace and a trans a transformation as a person. It's it's an extraordinary story. I want to make sure people know. What's the what's the status of this cancer that you're you've had to contend with? It's in remission. Stunning. Yeah, it's in remission. Stunning. Mm -hmm. Gratitude. Gratitude. <laughs> Tammy Peterson, wife, mother, cancer survivor, and honest seeker after the permanent things. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. It has been a pleasure talking with you, and I hope we can do it again. Thank you, sir. So I've been thinking, ever since my conversation with Tammy Peterson, I haven't been able to shake an image. It is the image of Tammy's toddler granddaughter at bedtime, dressed in her pajamas, standing in her crib, and shaking the crib's spindled walls. She is sweaty and screaming, bleary and crying for a good long time. This little girl is not in pain. She's not in danger. She just wants out. She demands it. She wills it. Now. I have a lot more in common with that toddler than I care to admit. Sometimes, no, often, I want my way. And I not only want it, I demand it. I will it. Our God is not unaware of our wants and our needs. In fact, he is supremely in tune with our appetites. But he's also infinitely well-versed in what is truly good for us. He distinguishes between that which is temporally satisfying and that which is eternally edifying. And so, like Tammy standing in the other room counseling her uncertain son and daughter-in-law, God allows our willful selves to wait, to cry it out, to rage, to spit and sputter, but to wait and so chasten our will until something extraordinary happens. And do you know what happens when our impatient will is worn out? We become quiet. We contemplate. We find ourselves exhausted, but transformed in our exhaustion. We are humbled and we relinquish control of that which we never had control from the beginning. The early chapters of Tammy's story, her willfulness and sense of control over her own destiny, proved to be a mirage. Cancer, especially an aggressive, life-consuming, terminal cancer, is not something you can simply will your way through. Beyond a wholesome and necessary discipline, no matter how much you shake the spindled walls or scream or cry, no matter how much you demand or will it, sometimes you just need to wait. Sometimes you need to trust. Sometimes you need to surrender to a God who loved you into existence, who sees and knows all. And with that surrender comes quiet, comes peace, comes clarity, comes transformation. 
Shortly after Tammy's son and daughter-in-law adjusted their approach to their willful granddaughter's bedtime routine, the subsequent days revealed a changed little girl. She had much less will and much more joy. Tammy herself was willful and determined to have control, but she found peace and humility and surrender. In prayer and communion with the all-knowing God, she found joy amidst uncertainty. Her broken will, paradoxically, mended her spirit. As St. As Saint Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast more gladly of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And as a wise priest once advised me, do you know what you want? Now pray to God about the poverty you have to achieve it without his help. Today, surrender willfulness and control and embrace the peace and grace that can flow from the love of the Father, the wounds of the Son, and the caress of the Holy Spirit. Stop shaking the crib and reclaim your joy. And one last thing. For this week's book, I would recommend Father Jean-Pierre de Cassade's Abandonment to Divine Providence. This book is exactly what it says it is, a call to humility and surrender to arrive at greater peace and joy. Father Cassade reminds us that a life of faith is a continual struggle against the senses. His passion for our embrace leaps off the page. He says, Oh, all you that read this, it will cost you no more than to do what you are doing, to suffer what you are suffering, only act and suffer in a holy manner. It is the heart that must be changed. Indeed, it is the heart that must be changed. Read this book and be changed. Thank you once again for joining me on the Evangelization and Culture podcast. I'm Todd Warner, and until we meet again, keep bringing Christ to a hungry culture.